it's a, a pleasure to get to share my work with all of you. Um, we'll be monitoring the uh, Q&A as we go too. So please, uh, please do ask questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we can kick it off then. And you'll see, is that slide advancing? Does that work for you guys? Someone give me a thumbs up. And a little zoom thing. All right, there we go. Thank you. Okay, cool. So this project, uh, we've kind of, we named it Work to Vec, um, and it's about learning the, what we'll call the latent structure of the labor market. Um, so this is joint work with Sarah Banna, who uh, is joining Chapman University as a, a professor soon, but for now she's still at Stanford, uh, Eric Renjolfsson uh, and Sebastian Steffen. Uh, Seb will be uh, at, at BC as well, but Big thanks to Max Fung. He's uh, an engineer in our team, um, does absolutely fantastic work. He's helped us build some of these things to scale. Because as we'll see, um, we're using about you know 250 gigs or so of job postings. And that text can get a bit unwieldy when you're building some of these models. Um, nevertheless, it's not that bad to do. Anyway, before we do that, uh, let's talk about the big picture here. And, the big picture for us is about understanding occupational dynamism. Many of you may be familiar that business dynamism across the developed world is you know, kind of declining for, for reasons that are sort of hard to understand. Um, there's a, a bunch of different candidates. We want to understand with the creation of new work or destruction of new work, um, can, we, can we find some of the answers to how quickly that's happening, uh, hiding in plain sight? Um, so, Lots of reasons why we might think that the labor markets are changing. Um, certainly, there's the last you know two or three years or so remote work and COVID. Um, that's uh, there's been some good things to come of that, even if the the overall sentiment is is fairly negative, um, understandably negative too. But then there's a you know sort of the same old questions that we've been asking for 20, 30 years in the economics and management and information systems community around automation, um, globalization, and, and so on. So um, the mental model I want everyone to kind of have when it comes to understanding what we're doing with these job postings is something akin to uh, we have this spatial arrangement of occupations in the economy and it moves. So think like um, there's solar systems and planets and we're trying to find coordinates of you know, planet software engineer as opposed to uh, planet salesperson or planet surveyor. There's lots of different types of occupations. They're all located somewhere in this space and some of them are getting closer to each other. Some of them are getting farther away. Um, we're gonna try to measure some of those distances and see if we can find some informative ways to measure how quickly occupations are changing. With one specific question in mind that we're gonna go through a bunch of things. That one specific question is, what is the gross rate of creation of new work? Okay, so when I say that, I mean, you know, including, um, if you were to include destruction of new work, you, you might subtract that off, but we're looking at just like how big is that space getting in, within certain jobs um, relative to others and then overall. Okay, so um, as I go, please, please ask questions and so. All right, so why are we doing, why do we care about this? Well, um, one thing that our team holds very near and dear to our hearts uh, here is, how do we think about helping displaced workers? Um, and especially if we can figure out where better opportunities are coming and where displaced work might show up. Um, the, this sort of real-time measurement where you can yank job postings off the internet, uh, process them and then say, here's, here's where the good opportunities are, here's where uh, things tend to be slowing down. Seems like it might be useful to a lot of people. And we, our plan is to open source as much of this as we possibly can. All right. So um, obviously, you know, I'm very interested in sharing all the actual results, but um, there's also a goal of ours is to highlight this set of um, ML and AI. You know, it's it's AI if it's in a PowerPoint. It's ML if you're writing code, whatever uh, you want to call it these days. But um, we're gonna we're gonna basically offer a new toolkit um, for you know, economics and business research um, that we think the, the CS people have built um, that, that can really, really help everybody. So uh, if you have questions about that after the talk, you know, feel free to email me. I'm happy to discuss all of these ideas. Okay, so 
how can we measure occupational change today? So in this sort of solar system model where we've got you know, spatial addresses of jobs, there's a few different things and uh, a few different ways of considering how that, that space is moving around. We take inspiration um, from a really nice paper on patents by uh, Zhao Ki Cheng, uh, Do Kyun Lee, and Sunny Tambe. Um, think about, you know, you could have the jobs frontier, you know, the outer shell of all the possible jobs. That could be getting bigger. Um, you might have destruction of some of the stuff that's going on before, uh, or you could have recombinations of different roles. That's not expanding the frontier, but that's, you know, maybe filling in some of the space within it. Okay. So what we're going to do is use um, uh, what's called the transformer based model of BERT. Um, BERT is one of the first uh, transformer based NLP uh, techniques. Um, we're going to use that to represent the, like, to, to convert text effectively to numerical representations, but this approach could be modular. You can, uh, you can apply it to the GPT-2 or um, one of the newer models as well. So uh, we're, I'll document a few techniques so you can see how it works. It might work for micro research as well as sort of the macro econ research and, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so some punchline results uh, from 2010 to 2019 where we've got our, our best data here. We see an expansion of the job space. There's more work being created. And in particular, the, the workspace is expanding at about three to 5% per year. Um, we don't see very much destruction of previously uh, existing jobs. Now, that doesn't mean that those jobs aren't in, there aren't some jobs where there's less demand for the, that kind of work. It's just that that type of occupation still exists. So like, you know, there's only one occupation in the last, or in the, in the post-war era that's really been kind of mostly eliminated and that's elevator operator. We don't see too many elevator operator uh, style changes in the last 10 years. Um, if changes are heterogeneous, though, not every occupation changes in the same way. Um, and I'll show you some of that. So you, you can think about what's going to happen in the future, kind of by thinking about what happened in the past. There's this really nice paper by Feigenbaum and Gross talking about um, what happened to telephone switchboard operators. Uh, this was a really important job, especially for women entering the labor force, um, especially prior to 1920. Uh, and then AT&T started trying to automate this work, frankly, automated a lot of this work. Um, for people who are doing this job past 1940, they didn't tend to be affected negatively. But, um, and obviously if you were kind of on the way out of the labor force in 1920 or so, you weren't badly affected. But people who were affected in the middle by this automation um, wave, they they did have negative a negative impact on their career. So. What we're hoping to do with this work, you know, in a broad sense, is provide toolkits to figure out who the telephone operators are uh, of today and, and try to route them, um, or at least provide options for how people might move from one job to the next. One of the things you get out of this is a numerical represent representation of all the jobs. So, you know, if if Planet Switchboard Operator is close to Planet Customer Service uh, person, then you know maybe this could be. Uh, a suggestion that you know we we build a ship that goes from one to the next. All right, cool. So let me uh, just keep an eye on the QA here as I'm going. All right, nothing. Okay, so there's a lot of great literature on this. I'm going to come out in the interest of time skip over this, but um, we are very much standing on the shoulders of giants who've done some great work in this area. One other paper I did want to spend a little bit more time on though. Um, is this really beautiful uh, paper by uh, Dronas Mogul and Pesquale or Strepo, um, where they describe how you basically have two options as a firm when it comes to automation and thinking about automation. Um, and automation might not be the only axis along which this question exists, but um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a second. So, um, if you were thinking about automating, perhaps the cost of capital dropped well below the cost of employing workers, and we line up every single task in the economy from hardest to automate to easiest to automate. Um, hardest to automate being all the way to the right, uh, easiest to automate being all the way to the left. And at some point, we're going to hit this I star, this index of the task that's marginal to automate. Okay, so you, you might invest in increasing I star 
in which case you make more things automatable. And you know, as you do that with more and more tasks, you kind of squish all the labor uh, market into a smaller and smaller tiny area. Um, at that point, you know, lots of workers are competing with each other, perhaps wages are lower. Um, if you're enterprising and you can think of a way to deploy a lot of smart people who are all doing some of the same tasks, you make a lot of money um, because you're doing something with a, an abundant resource as opposed to a scarce one. That's great news. So you have this incentive to not only shift out the frontier of what can be automated, but to shift out the frontier of what people do in general and create new tasks. Okay, now there's only a couple papers I know of, uh, David Otter and his colleagues have, uh, have won, but um, there, there's not that much work on measuring the create of creation of new tasks. Uh, we're aiming to provide one method to do that because in this awesome Ogle Restrepo model, um, that new task creation vector or uh, measure would be a scalar. Um, we're talking about building a, a multi-dimensional vector, and it turns out it's about a thirty-dimensional vector uh, for that. Um, oh, I should also mention uh, Engen Adelaide et al. Uh, they have another similar paper where they look at a job ads going back to nineteen fifty from nineteen fifty to two thousand in newspapers, um, and they see they can document some of the other changes we. Seeing the economy, you know, shifts away from routine tasks and so on. Most of their their key result is that most of the shift is within occupational groupings, not not uh, job competition. Okay, so um, let's skip through this. Uh, but yeah, when when we think about how jobs have changed, I brought up switchboard operators earlier. It turns out switchboard operator is still a job, even though a lot of it could be automated um, almost a hundred years ago now. Uh, a switchboard operator these days is a very different kind of job. Um, a lot of the people who do that are, are really doing more customer service. They're trying to help people say like for this job in Wilmington, Delaware, um, they're trying to answer, you know, on a private physician line and kind of figure out who's the best person to, to contact, uh, to manage confidentiality well, um, make people feel okay as they call them the doctor. So, you know, with all these changes that are happening, even if some of the jobs go away a little bit more than others, um, it, it makes sense to kind of figure out from the job text um, how quickly some of these jobs are changing and, and which directions. All right, so we're going to use burning glass technologies, uh, text data. This is a, a commonly used data set um, by now. So, um, you know, if you want to check out the compositional differences of burning glass with respect to um, with respect to the overall U.S. economy. We're going to be focused on the U.S. economy, but, but there's no reason you can't apply this to um, to pretty much any uh, you know any country where there's lots of developed online job ads. Um, you basically just need that a large language model has been trained for one of them. Um, what we find with burning glass is yeah, it's pretty good. Like. It does represent, as they say, the near universe of online job postings. There are some tilts and burning glass towards, you know, say knowledge work and away from, I don't know, construction or something like that. Um, but, you know, that's not necessarily a problem for us. Uh, I think one of the rarer jobs, for example, in our whole data set, I think we have like 65 dredge operator jobs posted, um, whereas we have millions of nurses, truck drivers, and salespeople. Okay. Um, the, the counts of the, the posting. So this is the word counts in each of the, the postings. This is important for us because we can only use 512 words from each posting. Um, they tend to be, you know, the modal postings about 500, but, uh, there's a long tail. Sometimes you really more detailed job postings. Okay. So top five postings, uh, I mentioned a couple of these. 2019, that's nurses, uh, sales reps, um, well, a couple, and a couple types of sales reps, customer service folks, and uh, truck drivers in 2010, uh, when online adoption of job ads was a little bit uh, less progressed, uh, the software developers and managers tended to show up a little bit more. But we've got great, great detail on most of these types of jobs. Um, so one thing we do to, to deal with the fact that we have sort of, we don't, 
You can do a couple of things if you're building a classifier, one of which is to make equal quantities of all the different types of postings. We figured that'd be throwing away a lot of data. So we kind of do something in between. One of the things we do is we look at the 75th percentile count of job postings. That's about 27,000 posts. And we cut it off at 27,000 posts so that um, if you have more than 27,000 posts for given occupational type in a given year, uh, we only use 27,000. Um, for everybody else, we use the full set, uh, unless you're, we do allocate for the usual machine learning thing where you, you pick some of your data as training, some of its validation, some of its tests. Um, but this is for the, the inputs into all of that. That's where we go. Okay, so we're going to use these, these large language models, things like BERT. And the reason you need to do something like that is because the language across different types of jobs, when you don't have context, um, can still be really similar. So the, on the left here, we've got a senior machine learning scientist at Amazon. And on the right hand side, we've got a machinist at Anheuser-Busch. All right, these jobs are extraordinarily different, but a lot of the words in the postings, there's sort of a vocabulary of postings. Uh, and a, a lot of the words in these postings are actually pretty similar. Um, and you've got support matching tooling and fabrication needs, uh, you know, on the other hand, we've got you know, design, development, and evaluation of highly innovative models for, for, for personalized product recommendations and search relevancy. Um, you may have it be the case that if I were to say machine, that you know, and we're using something like word to back, uh, word to back does not have context in it. So we'd pick up machine in a few different contexts to do the same thing, and it would make classifying these things hard. So an example is Python. Um, if you try to use word to vec uh, for Python, you get things like Monty Python, uh, Chapman, Cleese, Grail, Circus, and so on. Um, and we're not trying to push people to be comedians. There's a good amount of those already that people know. But we will obviously, you know, we don't want snakes or Monty Python. We want programming languages. Um, nevertheless, this embedding space idea is still very useful. We just want it to be contextual. And that's what Bert buys us. Um, BERT is a bi-directional encoders, it's the B and E there, but um, it's really sort of not directional. It's like if you if you want to mask a word and then predict the word using the words around it, so we hide the word when we train BERT, and then we predict what's hidden using words around it. Um, so you're not going forward in the sentence or backward in the sentence, you're kind of doing all of it at once. And that gets you um, closer to meaning. So we'll skip through. But that is um, what our model is doing. First thing we do is we tokenize the postings. Um, then we stick them, and that's sort of like putting them into BERT's vocabulary. Then we stick them through BERT, which generates for every posting a 512, 512 words by 768 columns. Those are the numerical representations of those words. So we've got an N by 512 by 768 tensor. And that tensor then gets put through a one dimensional convolutional layer. It's kind of shifting a window along all the words to kind of reduce the dimensionality there. So we get N, N postings, 509 um, uh, rows and 64 columns there. Then we do what's called max pooling where you take the maximum value within a certain range so that that converts us, in this case, it's, it's 509. So that converts us to an N by 64 uh, matrix. Then what we do is called you know, flattening uh, with batch normalization. So we're, we're standardizing all our variables and then sticking it into, into one row. And then you have a, a soft max layer that predicts one of the 824 different um, uh, occupational categories. So the soft max layer is just logistic regression. I know all things end up being logistic regression in the end. But basically the idea here is text in and occupational classification out. Now that's the only, not the only type of model we'll use, but that's one where we'll start. All right, here's visually what that looks like. You stick the job text in, you get a couple different layers. And then at the end, you've got this factor of probabilities of 824 probabilities for each type of occupation. And if you wanted to you know, kind of pin that to one occupation, you just take the maximum uh, value and that would be 124 dimensional factor. Look at the chat here. No questions. Okay. Um, so uh, let's move on. 
So how do we do with this? Uh, if you were to try to guess one of 824 occupations at random, even if you were being clever and just guessing nurse um, with no information, you'd, you wouldn't do particularly well. You might get 5% accuracy. What we got with our model, um, we find about three quarters of the time we, we nail the top one accurate, you know, that we nail the exact same category. And I should note, this isn't, um, the, the ground truth here that we're using is what burning glass has decided is the occupational category. Um, that's not necessarily going to be correct every single time, but we don't necessarily care either. What we want to learn is structure. We want the model to, to represent some similarities between the text uh, for jobs that are similar and to not demonstrate similarities um, when the text is not similar. Uh, because, you know, in the end, it's useful to have a, a tool that snaps text to occupational category for sure, but that doesn't give us much insight. What's going to give us insight is using that model to do different sorts of things um, and kind of diffing out the effects of like what's the actual ground truth. Because these occupational categories for us are really just kind of um, nebulous concepts. There are things that we made up. There is no truthful. This person is for sure 100% a software engineer. They might have characteristics that look a little bit more like customer service or management or something like that. So um, we kind of sidestep the need for a ground truth here. Uh, and, you know, if we're trying to match up against burning glass, we do pretty well. So three quarters top one accuracy. By the time you're in the top 15 accuracy, that is like, is the job that we predicted in the top 15 most likely, or is the actual job in the top 15 most likely jobs that we predicted? We're about 95% accurate. Um, okay. So... You know, here you can see that visually, that stuff along the diagonal, that red stuff. Um, that's where we're, we're predicting uh, the same class that it actually is. And if you're off diagonal, uh, you know, clearly we've left a little bit on the table here. You could, you could move off these things. But you can see, you know, within categories of jobs that are roughly similar, it's a bit darker. So if we're missing the right answer, we're at least landing somewhere nearby. Um, there's a few things where we don't, but you know, you can get rid of those in training. All right. So some questions quickly here. Why, why should we first train a classifier? Well, there's technical reasons, you know, we want to learn, as I said, sort of the latent structure of occupation. We want the 110 million parameter model to have similarities where there should be similarities and differences where there should be differences. Um, we also you know, might want to use that practically to, you know, for businesses, you know, we'll make this tool available. But then the substantive reasons are more around what it lets us do uh, with experimenting with the model's predictions. So uh, a technique we're inventing in this paper is called text injection. What we're going to do, it's, it's often very difficult to represent an idea that we have um, numerically, right? Like if I were to say, um, I want you to represent the idea that this posting wants AI skills in the posting numerically. It's very difficult for us to come up with, you know, more than say dummy variables or something like that. Um, text injection lets us, what we're going to actually do here is flip out part of the posting, throw that aside, and then we're going to replace the part we clipped out with a common set of text uh, across many postings that we use to represent a given concept. So I'll show you an example with remote work where we're gonna write a sentence that includes asking for remote work, inject that into lots of different postings, clip out you know, some words when we inject the, the text, and then we'll classify both the original posting and the text injected posting and compare how they change. So if we start leaning towards predicting certain types of work, when there's remote work present in the posting as opposed to away from other types of work, then we start to get a ranking of jobs based on how remotable they are. Okay, and I'll show you some of the results there. The other thing we can do, and you should check out, if this is interesting, uh, you should check out Sarah Bano's job market paper. She, she predicts salary and does tax injection uh, experiments to predict how, how salaries are different in the cross section. So think of this like, you know, to go back to our solar system example, we've got this big like spatial representation, this big like kind of manifold of where all the different jobs are located. And when you do a text injection, it's not necessarily a causal. I mean, there are restrictions you could put on this or assumptions you can make to say this is causal, but 
we're not quite there, we don't think. Uh, what we're doing instead is you've got this big figure um, that's represented by the model, and we're moving around on that figure by changing the text. So when you're moving on that surface, you can find interesting things about the, what the equilibrium is for different types of work. So um, talked about that. So this is the text that we inject to start with. We say this is a full-time remote position and employees can be based anywhere in the United States. And we're going to take some text at random out of the existing posting and stick this text in instead, and then compare how uh, the same posting is classified differently with and without um, that text injection. So the things that we get more of when we put this text in is, you know, is work like first line supervisors of office and admin support workers. We've got computer network specialists, um, network and computer systems administrators. Uh, the only weird one on this top five list is, is food service managers. There's a lot of managers on the types of work that can be remoted, and that comports with what uh, larger scale surveys have found. But Food service managers, I, I went and looked up what they do uh, in ONAP. And of the you know 30 odd tasks that they do, about two of them are really difficult to remote. And those two things are like checking inventory uh, in the kitchen or um, I forget, making sure that like, I forget the second one actually, but um, those are things that you could, you could have an employee who is on site uh, do fairly easily. And the rest of the job's remotable. So, we can start suggesting a little bit of a, you know, separation of, of the existing tasks from the current job bundles to, to suit the modern economy. On the other hand, uh, things that are not very often predicted to be asking for remote work, um, food prep, obviously, I guess, um, then secondary school teachers, uh, educational guidance, school and vocational counselors, like this is interesting because we, we obviously had a lot of that go remote, uh, throughout the pandemic. And I think people sort of universally are not very happy with all of that. Um, it didn't go particularly well. So we were interested to find that that, that was an outcome. Um, also hard to remote are truck drivers and, and special ed teachers. I, I did have one person tell me that truck drivers all work remotely. And I thought that was interesting as a, as a perspective. Um, so I don't know, maybe there's, there's a, a changing definition of, of remote there. So. Um, all right, I'm looking at Juan, you've got a question. So comparing the, when we say that we compare the change between the injected and non-injected job ad, does that mean comparing the predicted probabilities of the job and the, ad? yes. So uh, we are comparing the output vectors of probabilities for each one of these job types to each other and seeing, do we shift more towards one um, area of that vector than others? Juan, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, so we validate this a bit. So we um, there's this uh, Dingle and Neiman paper that you know was very timely, came out and offered a, a representation of which occupations could be you know remoted and which ones couldn't. Um, the scaling here makes the coefficients a little bit hard to interpret, but. You know, across a few different types of specifications, we have strong positive statistically uh, statistically significant correlations between our automated uh, generation of a remote index and the dingle neiman score. Um, and then you can see also in another paper I, I got with some colleagues, uh, the types of work that tended to switch to remote work were often managerial or professional. And this is not, not a surprise to anyone here, but um, that was more common than, say, folks working in, in manufacturing. Uh, okay, so you can do this with other stuff. We also splice in TensorFlow, uh, like we asked for TensorFlow as a skill. Uh, very few uh, mental health counselors and amusement and recreation attendants are going to use TensorFlow, but there's a lot more computer systems analysts, programmers, web developers who do. Um, similarly, for R and SQL, you see a lot of computer and information research scientists even sales workers, um, they tend to be more often predicted when you in inject that text. Um, recreation workers, dining room attendants, um, cooks, they are not often using R. Um, let's see, I've got about 15 minutes here. We could go over the mathematical aspects of that, but I wanna get into some of these cooler uh, results. So one of the issues 
With using a classifier to represent distance, though, it's, it's useful for doing this, um, this text injection stuff, but there's a problem, which is that, you know, to create yet another spatial analogy, um, if every posting comes from, say, an island where they speak the language of that posting and we're trying to classify these islands, um, what you're trying to do effectively is, is put a plane in the water between the islands. And with respect to classifying, it doesn't matter how much space there is. It doesn't matter how much water there is between the islands. You can still get the plane through there. If there's a little bit or a lot, which means that the distances you have between the different places in this job space are contingent on how long you're training and how much data you have. That's not necessarily something we want if we want to understand the rate of creation of new, new work. Um, what we want instead is regularization where we can take a prior, uh, in this case, a multivariate Gaussian prior, and pull together all of these different spaces so that they're all kind of clumped and distance of meaning now. So you want a regular space. Um, you know, and for that, variational autoencoders solve the problem. So a variational autoencoder is a little bit like a, a giant nonlinear PCA where we're going to create on the end of that vector where we've got probabilities of jobs, that probability of job vector is going to be both the input and the output uh, to a bolt-on for this model. So what you do is you encode that probability of jobs in a lower dimensional latent space, and then you train a decoder that takes the lower dimensional information and decodes it back to the original vector. And by training that uh, over and over, what you get out of that is the encoding, um, the encoder and the decoder, and that encoding is valuable for us to start to measure how the space is moving around. All right, so um, visually, this is kind of what it looks like. That stuff to the left is still basically the same model, um, but on the right-hand side, now we're taking the encoder and we're sticking it into, or like cramming that information into a, a narrower channel, um, and we pick. I'll show you how we pick dimension and size in a, in a bit, but um, we find you know this does actually pretty well for for describing work in in uninterpretable ways. Um, so the numbers we're going to get out of here are going to represent the variation in the postings pretty well, but they might not have a clear um, interpretation for what what they mean. Nevertheless, we can do some some kind of geometry and geometric statistics on, on what's going on there. So how do we pick the number of dimensions to cram the, all this stuff through? Well, you know, on, on here at the top here, you can see how the loss improves if we have five factors. Um, it doesn't do too badly, actually. We, we get some summer information. If you add 10, you do much, much better. Um, you add 15, you just do a little bit better. And by the time you're at, you know, say 30 or more, you're really just not getting that much uh, additional predictive power out of this. So, we stop it at 30. We also have a, a 10 factor model. Um, you know, it turns out, yeah, there's about 30 things that move in the labor market. Um, we don't necessarily have good names for them, but if you combine them in some way, you can represent most of the work that's out there. So there's kind of a fun fact. Um, so, and here's what it looks like. So each one of these things is normally distributed by assumption, but um, it tends to work pretty well. And, some of these things have like a, a wider left tail, some of the wider right tail. One of the things we can do if we've got 30 different factors is we can fix 29 of them at you know, zero or the mean. And then we move from an extreme value in that last factor, say two standard deviations or three standard deviations down to three standard deviations up. And we see how the predicted job changes. So right in the center of most of these factors turns out to be logisticians. They're sort of your, uh, I don't know, your stem cell of, of jobs. Um, you can, a logistician, I guess, if you're, if you're good at planning uh, how to get something done, um, there's a lot of different jobs that you could maybe be moved to. But taking this, you know, say first factor, as we go from the extreme, you know, three standard deviations down in that factor, we start at paralegals and legal assistants then we move to education, guidance, school, and vocational counselors, to stock clerks, to logisticians, to computer and information systems managers, and then finally architectural and engineering managers. So in some sense, paralegals and architectural and engineering managers, they're kind of like opposites, um, at least on, on this particular 
dimension. Um, there's another one in here that's, uh, you know, let's see if we can find it. Um, yeah, so on one extreme of factor six is like word processors and typist, typists. Um, you move through credit counselors to logisticians to architects, and then you end up at surveyors. So this is sort of like a, you know, word processors and typists are not building buildings or, you know, outside um, kind of surveying land. That's not something that they would do. Um, you know, my favorite one is oral and maxillofacial uh, surgeons are kind of the opposite of air and missile defense crews. I don't know what that factor would mean in real life, but we have 30 of these different things. And one of the things you can do is kind of build these, these genotypes of what jobs look like underneath the hood by looking at how these factors are moving around. So here's commercial pilot. Um, pilot postings have been increasing in the test set. We go from about you know 50 postings for pilots in 2010 to over 800 by 2019. And the spectrum of these factors doesn't really move that much. Um, they're kind of stable through time. It's sort of hard to, to see any major changes there. There's a few little ticks up or down, but um, aside from you know one or two things, not that volatile. Um, paying attention to the scaling here though, office clerks, they tended to move a little bit more. Uh, so pilots, their work is relatively stable. Uh, office clerks work was not that stable, um, relatively speaking. So, you know, we get a movement up in factor 16, they become less like social workers, more like clerks. Uh, 26, they become less like information systems managers, more like customer service. Uh, and movement down in, in 18, so less like CEOs and more towards delivery workers. You can do this for logisticians too. They're relatively stable, except for a factor or two. Um, that one down is away from surveyors and towards typists. Yeah. Um, you do it for computer systems managers. Uh, you know, you guys are kind of getting the, the sense of what we do here. So you can also look at how stable the, the measures here are. Um, for some of them, they're very stable. For some of them, uh, they're not. There tends to be a downward slope where um, the standard deviation, the variance in these predictions tends to drop um, over time. And that's good because we're getting better data. Um, okay, so I did this uh, talk at Stanford. Um, and one of the things you can do is collapse all these different factors and average over employers. And then you can predict what is, uh, for this employer, what job are they? Um, so let me just check here, make sure that okay, we're good on, on the chat, but um, yeah, so you know, we could answer the question by decoding the vector for Stanford, what, what job would Stanford be? Turns out Stanford's kind of a, a management occupation. Um, if you were to look at USC, it's a post-secondary teacher, uh, comma other. Um, I haven't looked at Penn. Facebook's interesting. Uh, Facebook is a PR specialist and not a software engineer. Um, there's some other ones that we looked at, CVS, pharmacy, uh, they're a pharmacist. Um, Deloitte was a consultant. I mean, some of the companies are exactly what you'd expect and some of them can be a little bit surprising. So, uh, and some other work that I'm, I'm doing with uh, Sunny Tambay and Barry Wang, uh, Barry's a student in our department, we're trying to classify the inputs to AI. And one of the things we've built along the way are these point array embeddings of skills and occupations. I like to call these Death Star plots. Um, and it shows you pretty quickly how complicated certain firms are. So in this, this idea of what job is a firm, we can see whether there's a lot that's going into uh, that classification or not very much. So on the left-hand side, we've got Walmart, which is an extraordinarily complicated organization. Um, they've got workers in all different facets. You can think of like the center of this plot as being the firm. And then as you get farther to the you know, the, the boundary, you're going deeper into more specified skills. Um, now on the right-hand side, uh, we have a less complicated business, still a very complicated business, but it doesn't employ nearly the same operations, equipment or facility management or admin staff that a company like Walmart might. Um, this uh, is Google. So you can see they've got a very heavy sales and marketing component and very heavy tech component. So we start to see a little bit um, 
going on there. In the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about a few different jobs here, though. Um, so one of the things we can do, I showed you some of the sort of aggregate results, but what we can do is look at these jobs relative to each other by taking the centroid of those jobs at a point in time and then looking, does the, does the centroid move around a lot? And then how far is the average job in a given year from that centroid? So the left-hand side is that first thing. How much is that centroid moving? So this is for athletic trainers. They don't move that much, as it turns out. Um, but on the right-hand side, you know, is the average job in within athletic trainers, is that getting closer to the centroid? Um, that tends to be the case. That's what that drop uh, in, in the value is. So, so um, in some sense, athletic trainers are becoming more standard in, in terms of how they're being asked uh, to apply to jobs, at least. So on the left-hand side, we've got cashiers here. Um, cashier centroids used to move more, now they don't move as much, and they're also stabilizing where the typical cashier is getting closer. So one thing I'll, I'll say here, a big caveat for all this work, and we're, we're trying to bound it by using balance panels across the board. All of these are, are based in balance panel um, data for, for the main results here. Um, the one thing that we're concerned about is that language is changing differentially to describe work in ways that have nothing to do with like what you're actually asking people to do. So if language is changing and it's describing how the work is changing, that's great. But if we've gone from asking software engineers to code to you know asking software engineers to be ninja rock stars or something, um, that could be an issue for the kind of work that we're doing. Um, so we're trying to bound that by looking at within the same firm region pair, you know, over time does that um, does that change still happen, you know, we can say, well, at most this, this mount is coming from, uh, from those kind of language changes. Here's paralegals. The centroids are moving less than they were before, um, and the jobs are mostly stabilizing, but recently paralegals have been asked to do some stuff that's slightly different. Um, and maintenance repair worker and repair workers, they're pretty volatile. Um, the centroid moves a lot earlier in the decade and uh, not as much later on, but it's been picking up a lot. And um, those are, are also becoming, like the average job is becoming closer to the centroid lately. So you could think of this as like an occupational diversity measure. Uh, how far from the centroid are you? Uh, the least, you know, diverse in terms of how much, how, how much the work varies, um, you know, in 2010, that's something like a pharmacy tech or nurse anesthetist, um, speech and language pathologist, a lot of medical work. Um, the, the more varied types of work tend to be like computer programmers or human resource specialists. Um, more recently, it's still a lot of medical stuff on the left-hand side where that's, that stuff is, uh, tends to be pretty standardized. On the right-hand side, it's still a lot of tech work and management work um, that ask people to do lots of different types of things of the same title. Um, I'm going to skip over this uh, for now in the interest of time, but one thing I want to leave you with the, with the last couple of minutes here is what is this posting space, you know, that original question, how much in aggregate are jobs moving around? What is this posting space doing? So around the edge here, we have the convex hole of all the postings um, in 2010, but mapped into two dimensions. So this is a, a, a much bigger, uh, higher dimensional figure, and we're squishing it down to two dimensions. Nevertheless, you see this, this like mound of jobs in the middle with some things kind of on the outside. Now, as you expand that, here's 2015, that mound is starting to spread out a little bit, um, fill in some of the space around it, and that continues into 2019, at which point you still have a clump in the middle of a lot of similar work, but the expansion towards the frontier is happening at a much faster um, or a much more uh, advanced clip. Here. So we wanted to measure that. Um, I'll skip over some of the details there, but basically what, if you wanted to calculate a convex hull in 824 dimensional figure, it'd be very difficult. Um, it, it takes a lot of computation. Even a, a 30 dimensional figure over millions of postings is gonna be super hard. So what we do is, we're going to sample uh, subspaces or subpoints of of this uh, job space, and then we're going to calculate the volume of the convex hole that encapsulates all of those points um, iteratively, and build a distribution of our samples. So these are CDF plots of our uh, our distribution of samples, and you can see instead of comp comparing means, what we're going to do is you know check for first order stochastic dominance. 
that is, is one of these things to the right of the other. And what we find is kind of a monotone shift to the right in the cumulative distribution of the volumes of sam like the sample volumes here. So uh, what that means is that over time, the volumes are increasing on average throughout our sample. And it's, it happens every year that the previous year has got a smaller volume in our data set. It also turns out that the variance of the volumes is increasing. That's a variance over the thing. So we're, we're expanding that um, sense of how, you know, what's the difference in the varieties of work. We're expanding that um, pretty quickly, some years more quickly than others. Um, so, you know, we're seeing the frontier not only expand, but it's, it's starting to get filled in, as you saw in the earlier pictures. Here's what that looks like in terms of, you know, an average. Um, over time, it's starting to, to increase. And so we think it's, you know, it depends how you, what you, what you modify with and if you use the balance panel or not, but it's somewhere between three and 5% a year. So, you know, think going back to that question about automation, um, in gross terms, this makes me considerably less worried about automation taking away all of the work. We're creating new work at a pretty quick clip. We're making a lot of new, new work every year in gross terms. That doesn't mean that in net terms, there aren't still places um, you know, where, where things are, are not going well. So we have to think about the distributional um, consequences of automation. But this, uh, this idea that automation is going to take all the jobs, I think that's kind of not something I'm worried about uh, in light of the Osmo Blue Strapo um, the framework. Um, similar things on area, but we don't have to talk about that. So getting back to that Osmo Blue Restrepo, Restrepo framework, we're, we're thinking about throughout this job space, where are we seeing destruction of work versus where are we seeing expansion? We see in gross terms, a lot of expansion, but as I showed you with a few of these specific occupations, um, some work changes, you know, everybody's getting much more similar. Some work is expanding. Um, people are doing different work and sometimes work is volatile where that centroid moves around a lot and sometimes it's not. So um, every, every type of job is kind of facing a different set of conditions. Sometimes they're similar, sometimes they're not. Um, I should say as well, you can use these these vectors of different jobs, you can calculate simul similarity measures, and we have like automated generation of uh, workplace hierarchies. So, you know, if you want a taxonomy for work, we can build one very quickly out of this stuff. Um, and you can see that there's some areas of that taxonomy that are, are more stable than others. Um, and that, when we see some disruption in one area, we might be able to say, okay, well, here's a similar area, uh, which might be fruitful to move towards. Uh, you know, in my case, you know, moving from being a professor to being a uh, brain surgeon might be really difficult, but uh, moving from being a professor to a corporate data scientist, um, you know, there's a lot of similar work that we do. All right, so some next steps here. We're looking at some different types of output. So we've already done this for remote work. Um, turns out the remote work scores, uh, if, you, if you average over the different jobs you have, um, some remote work scores, you don't get too different a result from just predicting the remote work directly. Um, Eric and I, along with Tom Mitchell, have this uh, suitability for machine learning score, so we can predict from the text how exposed different occupations are to, to ML. We're going to do a lot more text injections with this kind of stuff, too. Where we'd like some help, if you got some ideas, is how to, how to build in some causal links and, and move around this space in a causal manner. Um, we have a few ideas for, like, technology skill shocks, but, um, you know, maybe doing some, like, shift share stuff, but uh, if people have other ideas, we're, we're really excited to hear them. Um, so yeah, and that'll help us uh, test some more things in management and econ. Um, so with that, I guess uh, I'll leave it there. Um, you know, here's a sort of summary. We're training this big model or set of models where we, we put in text and we get out predictions of different kinds. Um, and then we use that to, to understand how the space of jobs is changing. So it's primarily a descriptive paper, um, but we're looking to build in some new uh, causal components as well. All right, cool. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Daniel. That was uh, fantastic and, and very exciting, both in terms of the, the methods, the data, the team, the fact that you're working with, data, with engineers to do this, and also the idea of, of releasing tools uh, and data as well as, as findings. That sounds super exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing more steps around that. So 
we have already three questions in the chat. Uh, but actually, okay. I was going to say to uh, anyone who has a question, what they need to do is type their question in the chat or just say, I have a question and then we'll come to you and mute you. You ask the question and then we go through we go through them that way. We're going to start with uh, Max and, and maybe like when you when you are unmuted, if you want to uh, briefly say uh, who you are and, and your institution as well, that would be great. We begin with Max Huang. Oh, uh, yeah, this is Max Huang. Uh... Nice presentation, thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, it's very interesting to, because I believe with you, the purpose of classification is not for classification itself, but uh, to try to understand latent uh, space, mm -hmm. like uh, vector representation. So interesting to see the development in Europe and the uh, uh, United States. The, I know ESCO used the sentence transformer expert for factor representation and uh, uh, understand the, the occupation similarity. Did you try the sentence uh, transformer? I would love to see the comparison. Uh, of That's a really program. good idea. Uh, so we have not trained a sentence transformer. We've tried going the other way uh, where we, we try to train the long former um, instead. Uh, that took a long time um, and we were burning a lot of cycles on it. Um, we actually have sort of a, a lot of compute credits that we need to use uh, very soon. Um, if we don't, then they're, they're gonna evaporate. Um, if a sentence transformer would be useful, I, I can add that to the list and see if we can get that trained up um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Yep. Next we have uh, John. Hey there, John. I guess I can see the question in the Q&A. Um, yes, I, I, I can uh, talk. Uh, uh, Daniel, great, great presentation. I uh, really love the work. I'm just curious about um, the, uh, the uh, this um, database is fascinating. Um, can you tell a little bit about the difference um, you know, because people think that uh, right now, a lot of turnover, people left their old job for new jobs. From the job posting, can you tell the difference between, you know, the job posting just for growth, new jobs, versus, well, I have to replace the old job left by departure or retirement? Right, right. Um, great question. So we run, we have run all of these results um, using both balanced and unbalanced panels. And when I say balanced, I mean, we look to see if that firm occupation or even firm occupation region combination exists throughout the entire data set. And then we throw out everybody that doesn't exist throughout the data set. And we check the results uh, compared to the unbalanced panel where we just use everybody. And we see basically the same thing. Um, so that either tells us that um, the, the stuff that's coming in or going out is kind of qualitatively similar. Um, or it offsets, uh, or it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, we were encouraged by that set of results. The, um, the cross section and the changes tend to be uh, not, too, not too poor representation of each other there. But um, yeah, I mean, there are some like sort of level shifts that happen. Um, but yeah, I would say in general, we can't, we can do an easier, we have an easier time uh, looking at job uh, replacement versus new types of work that the company's never posted for. It'd be very difficult to say, you know, that the an absence of postings is an absence of work at that firm. If, you know, maybe that firm's really good at retaining people or something like that. Um, but I think that's a great question. And certainly like, that's something that we've been thinking about a lot. Next we have Catherine. Hi, uh, thank you. So I, I was very interested in the results about the expansion of the job space. My question is whether you can be sure that what you're seeing really is an expansion of the job space as opposed to firms becoming more likely to advertise certain types of jobs on, on burning glass. You, you had some results at the very beginning about 
changes in the mix of what was advertised. And I wondered how much of what you're seeing with the expansion of the job space could be that. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the things that the balance panel is designed to, to mitigate. Um, because then we're seeing only firms that existed in the beginning as well as the end. Um, that helps a little bit, but we're, you know, we're bounding things there. One of the things that I like to look at to kind of deal with that question, because it's that's definitely, um, I'd say that's at the core of, of the sorts of questions I would ask about this or kicking the tires hard enough. Um, and that's comparing like the first five years of the data set to the second five years. Once uh, adoption of online postings is mostly diffused, um, we still see a lot of the same results. Um, there is a look, there's a faster rate of occupational change in the first five years or so. But for the primary conclusions of the paper, I think the second five years are, you know, if you'd said those are the results the whole way through, I would have said, oh, okay, cool. Um, like I've, I've come to the same sorts of conclusions. So I think the job space is expanding. What I'm trying to do now is bound um, the error for a similar kind of question, which is, you know, how much is that rockstar ninja, how we describe work, even if the work hasn't changed, how much is the language issue um, going on there, uh, as opposed to the, um, you know, genuine changes in the application. But yeah, the balance panel does tend to deal with a little bit of that adoption effect, but it, it selects you into a different part of the sample too. Great, thanks. Yep. Next, we have Joseph, who actually doesn't have a mic. So uh, maybe we can read the, the question and, and answer it. So uh, complimenting on the use of dimensionality reduction and saying it would be great to discuss further extensions with retention rates to get insight on labor market matching efficiency. Oh, totally. Uh, yeah, and this is something that uh, Seb Stefan on our team is super excited about. Um, so if you want to talk matching efficiency, uh, we should get that that conversation going. He is, he really wants to build a tool that helps uh, companies and workers find each other better uh, using this kind of stuff. Thanks for the comment. Uh, we have now Siddharth. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. I am uh, job advertisements tend to um, uh, miss the implicit skill information. So do you think this missing implicit skills can affect your uh, results or? I, that's a great question. Uh, we've discussed this a little bit, um, though I would, I'll admit not nearly as much as we should have. Um, we, you know, something like public speaking might be an implicit skill set uh, for, say, a salesperson, right? Like, and maybe it's not ever asked for in the posting, or as something diffuses, um, you know, if you're if you're asking a software engineer uh, or you're trying to hire a software engineer. Um, you might not ask them if they know how to code, but you'd ask them if they know a specific language. Um, and Excel might just be assumed, like you assume they know how to use Excel. So um, I wonder as we get sort of ubiquitous work, this is a little bit like if you're trying to value, so in my other work, like valuing intangibles, um, if you try to value open source software generally, um, there's two parts that, you know, and you're looking at firm level data, you can value the part that's relevant to the firm, but there's this whole part that's valuable to everybody all the time that's kind of taken out um, by doing that. So from that perspective, this change, if there's like implicit skills that are being propagated through to lots of different jobs, the change that we're measuring is a little bit of an underestimate. Mm -hmm. um, if it went the other way, where there's this implicit skill that's vanishing from the economy, um, then it, it's it's going to be an overestimate. So um, I'm not quite sure how to deal with that. We might have to just go with our data as best as we can. But I, I really love this question. Um, that's uh, also particularly when a new job is getting created, that you would not know the what is the implicit skill with if for that new job as well. Right. Right. So I think one way that we could deal with them. We're talking a little bit about doing this is by looking at sort of the varied levels of work across different occupation or different postings in the same occupation. Um, we might be able to get sort of the superset of what everybody's asking for. And that superset might be closer to the, you know, actual thing. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that's a good thing that if we can make some of this data available to everybody, um, perhaps with the help of burning glass, uh, that's a good thing to do. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you. So uh, we don't have any more questions in the list, but we have someone who raised their hand. It's uh, John Forth. I don't know if uh, you want to unmute John, uh, Sarah, so he can ask his question. Can you hear me, Yvonne? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on that point about the implicit skill, because I think in some of your presentation, Daniel, you showed that the the variance, I think, of the words that were used was quite narrow for some of the health occupations. Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess some of that is about the fact that those occupations are essentially certified, right? Yep, exactly. So that certification qualification in order to do that job. And that's the, that's the uh, shorthand way of specifying a whole set of skills. So yeah. I guess that partly uh, addresses this issue about some, some job adverts just don't say a lot because they have a shorthand way of indicating the skills that are needed. And some of that is through the certifications that you need or qualifications to do that job. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, a cardiac surgeon is a cardiac surgeon. Uh, that there's yeah, not so a whole then, bunch of description that gets into that. But if you were to say, oh, I need a, a manager, like, what does that mean? Um, you know. So some of that information then on the extent to which certain jobs require specific qualifications might help to explain some of the variance in the in the amount of information you get in the job advert. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and that that is cross country variation in the US. It's got cross state variation in terms of what the occupational licensing requirements are. Exactly. I learned recently that uh, it is illegal to cut your own hair in New Hampshire. Um, yeah, so, indeed. You know, that's a uh, there's a fun one. Um, I guess my wife who cuts my hair, uh, she'd be a criminal there. But then you might you might <laughs> test that idea by looking for the cross state variation in what gets posted in the. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. Um, I'll bring that one uh, back to the team too, because there's some interest in occupational licensing with the, within the co-author team too. So I think we're out of time. Uh, uh, so, and I didn't get, get to ask any questions. Actually, I'll send you an email with those, uh, Daniel. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for an amazing presentation, and, and thanks to everyone who attended for like the great questions. Um, yeah, it was absolutely a, pl a pleasure. Thank you all, and thanks for the great comments and feedback. It's going to help make the paper better. Thank you, and uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, just to conclude uh, with a uh, promotional part, uh, and this is that the reminder to everyone that the ESCO conference. It's taking place in the, on the 25th and 26th of May, and the registration is open. Uh, you should all sign up and, and come to Strathclyde University uh, for a, what's going to be a great conference. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, see you very soon. Thanks, everyone. Take care.